Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Benels, for the invitation to chat you all. And uh, unfortunately, can't see you, obviously, but uh, I guess these slides will, will have to do. So as been mentioned, we're really interested in my group in, in looking at some uh, making these nitrogen containing molecules. But before I get there, I thought it might be good to just, you know, get all the marketing bits out of the way as is customary with these types of things. Just to let you in on a little bit where I'm from and, you know, just tell you a little bit about our continent and country and all those things. So, of course, you, some of you might be familiar with this African continent, of course, and South Africa is all the way down here, the south of Africa. Not too original, I suppose, but I guess, <laughs> I guess we're working on that at the moment. So where I'm from specifically in South Africa is actually the southernmost part, if I just go back to that slide, which is all the way down here, this bottom point. And that's uh, Cape Town. And if you haven't been to Cape Town, please do come. We would love to have all of you over uh, for Cape Town. This is just some of the sites that you could see. If you sort of take some of these helicopter rides, you can see that this is the new stadium that we built, the football or soccer, depending on where you come from, the stadium. That's Table Mountain over there, Lion's Head. Very nice. And some other views of Cape Town. And of course, our national flower, the Proteas, our cricket team is named after that. We're quite good at that. And uh, Cape Town also has, or just around the corner from Cape Town, Stellenbosch is also synonymous with our wineries and wine farms. Quite famous, I guess. And I guess you can't mention Stellenbosch and, you know, linking into that. Just to know some more marketing. There's a nice South African chemical conference coming up next year in January. So if you are keen, please have a look at this. And we hopefully we see you in Stellenbosch in January uh, next year. But now that that's out of the way, this is the University of Cape Town, a beautiful campus that we have over here, just on the foot of Table Mountain. Uh, it's Table Mountain over there, and this is Devil's Peak up here. And our chemistry department is just over there. You can see probably the building that doesn't look the greatest <laughs> compared to some of the other ones um, over there. But as I mentioned, what we really like to do is uh, in, our, in our group is to make these bioactive nitrogen-containing heterocycles. And if you take a look at some of these uh, heterocycles over here, uh, you can see that they're quite complex structures, but more importantly, why we go for the nitrogen heterocycles is they have quite interesting activities, you know, depending on the various types of scaffolds. If you go from these hexahydropyrrole indoles, quinolinones, beta lactams, isoxazolines, they all have these really interesting and a wide uh, range of activities. So to be able to make these uh, is really important. But more importantly, we really want to do this in really sustainable or environmentally friendly manners. And the reason for that is particularly so that we can advance a more, you know, sustainable or responsible type of drug discovery programs. We have loads of methods for making molecules, but sometimes, you know, they do require a couple of expensive metals, a couple of harsh reaction conditions. We'll come to this in a second, why this is important. Um, using these harsh reaction conditions, or more specifically, these energy intense processes. I'll get to that in a second, particularly in the context of my work. And you might find that in most drug discovery programs, you utilize these processes only for a couple of milligrams. So you can test the compound. You know, you might have a, a whole bunch of steps that require all these resources for a couple of milligrams. And you know what? The compound turns out to be completely inactive. And you've for all intent and purposes, not necessarily wasted, but you could have potentially come up with a better way that's not as resource heavy for an inactive compound. So what we really try to do is develop complementary methods so that we don't use these types of really precious resources when we don't need to, right? So we don't worry about using them. We love using them. Sometimes they really, you have to use them, but that's really what we're trying to push here, that we use them only when we really have to use them. So really, we tried to make these molecules really sustainably and particularly using not very energy intense processes such as heating, right? And that's really important in the context of South Africa. So the way we do that is using photochemistry, you know, using light as the key energy source for making all these types of interesting uh, bonds, you know, all bond connections that we might want to create and maybe try and replace some of these metals in processes where we can, right? So you can see the title of the slide here is using photochemistry. And for us, it's really, really been an absolute lifesaver. So <laughs> not to cause your anxiety there, but this is potentially, or this is in fact the story. And as it goes for a second, you were probably wondering what's going on. Everything's just dark, no one's speaking. 
And right now what's going on in South Africa, if you're not aware of this, is that we have this thing called load shedding, right? And what it is essentially is that our power gets cut completely for about, you know, somewhere between eight and 12 hours every single day. And it's been doing that for the last year, for the last three months or three weeks, actually a couple of years, but really intensely for the last month. So what I've done is I've actually put a, I actually have a laser point to this. I put, this is our load shedding schedule for today. And this is Friday. You can see that at the moment we stage three in my power in Cape Town right now, it's about five past seven um, <laughs> in the evening. So in the next hour, our power is going to get cut for two hours over there. You can see that. So <laughs> it's really, really um, bizarre. But what you'll notice is this isn't actually a South African problem. This is actually an African problem where we have really fragile energy grids. So in the context of what we want to do, we've actually discovered that we we'll, we'll realize that we don't necessarily have the luxury of heating reactions, particularly because of this, what we call load shedding. We don't actually have the luxury of heating reactions for extended periods of time purely for this reason, because if we do need to heat the reaction overnight, for example, the power will just cut at some point and then it essentially messes everything up. Contrary though, we can use photochemistry using LED lights these are really low power. And why it's been a lifesaver for us really is we take our reactors, this is just a snapshot from our lab. We take our reactors, we hook it up to this little UPS battery set. So when the power does go out in the lab, uh, our reactors carry on working and we continue doing chemistry. So this is really the type of vision that I have for our group really in the context of the challenges, the real world challenges that we have in, in Africa is to try and develop these methods that really, really make a difference where we are still able to make really important life-saving molecules when resources just suddenly disappear because you know that that's real for us here um, in Africa. So just to highlight this, this obviously isn't this isn't actually directly related to our talk of energy transfer to catalysis, but it's part of our story. And just to highlight this particular example of how we try to showcase this in our context. So here's my fantastic PhD student Menashe. And what we wanted to do in tackling one of these types of key scaffolds called the quinolinones is develop a cascade, radical cascade sequence, a metal, uh, hopefully ca metal catalyzed radical cascade sequence. I'm not gonna speak about this too much, but the, the take home message here, if you notice the reaction conditions, we managed to use with some um, silver nitrate and, uh, and a terminal oxidant per sulfate. And this reaction went on at 100 degrees. And essentially, uh, if you're really interested, I can go through the mechanism of it later, but essentially what we do is you form an acyl radical at this position that can then add in over here, adds back onto the ring and following another set of uh, decarboxylative single electron transfer, that second carb decar uh, carboxyl group falls off and we essentially form the molecule uh, that we're after. But like I said, the key take home message is that this reaction was run at 100 degrees Celsius. So during the course of this work, we actually had some really intense load shedding and we had to run these reactions overnight. And when Asha came to me, he's like, wait, this is not working. We can't keep doing this. So I said, well, Manashi, we have to then figure out another way. So I left Manashi alone and he came back and said, you know what, using photocatalysis, we just throw in a little bit of a catalyst, it's the cyanoarene catalyst. And with just, I think it's a couple of more percent, two more percent of the cyan catal uh, cyanoarene catalyst, we can take that temperature down all the way to room temperature, do exactly the same transformation, and we can do exactly the same chemistry. And we actually tried to showcase that and Manashi made a whole bunch of examples using this photochemical method rather than a heating method. And you can see here conditions one or two, where one is thermal 100 degrees, or conditions two is in the presence of some photocatalyst at room temperature. And you can see here the yields are really comparable and we were really pleased, sometimes even better, I suppose. We were really pleased to see that this is this was really working, that we could actually you know, try and solve these real world challenges that we might actually have um, on the African continent. But anyway, like I said, I promised you some work on energy transfer catalysis. And essentially what this is, is it's one of the two main arms of photochemistry. So the first arm would be photo redox catalysis using single electron transfer processes. And the second arm would be energy transfer catalysis. And this is not necessarily that, it's not the, you don't necessarily use redox processes, it's purely photophysical uh, types of uh, processes. So if I can showcase this in these two cartoons, Sometimes you want to access a molecule, some type of accepted molecules, triplet energy state, so that you can do some really exciting chemistry. But thankfully, not all molecules just in the presence of light start 
forming triplet states and reacting, that would be disastrous, you know, just walking in the street, things just start reacting with everything. So that's a good thing, but sometimes you really want to get a molecule to access its triplet state. And what you can do in the case where normal light doesn't allow some type of acceptor to get excited to a triplet state with one of its excited states, is you can irradiate it in the presence of some photosensitizer. What that does is of a specified wavelength, I guess, of a specified wavelength, the photosensitizer can get excited to its triplet state or its excited state. It then takes that energy, if you will, in this cartoon type of view, view uh, takes that energy, transfers it over to the acceptor molecule, or whichever molecule you're hoping to get excited. And in doing so, it jumps down to the ground state and the actual donor molecule or the acceptor molecule can then end up in its triplet state. And you can start doing really exciting chemistry. So this is the cartoon showing this energy transfer catalyst process, essentially just transferring energy from one molecule to uh, another molecule. Perhaps a more scientific look of it is essentially viewed as a double electron process, right? If you view it as a simultaneous oxidation and reduction, you know, sort of inverted commas in order to get to the same triplet excited state. But let's not get too much into the photophysical aspects. Let's get onto the synthesis. So what we wanted to do was showcase these types of energy transfer uh, methods to making some really important nitrogen heterocycles. And the two that we really were interested in focusing on were the quinolinone, so the cousin of the ones that Monashi made, these um, saturated ones, or the unsaturated one that Monashi made, but the dihydroquinolinones were these sort of uh, saturated molecules over here using energy transfer catalysis. So while we were working on this, uh, there were actually two reports came out. So we published this last year in Auglet. Two publications came out um, using these iridium and uh, platinum, really expensive rare metal catalysts. And as I said, what we tried to do is really to look at things more sustainably. So if we can avoid heating, we really want to do that. And if we can avoid using these very expensive metals, we really want to do avoid using those as well. So what we were interested in at the time is using these really cheap thioxanthone catalysts. These are really known, these are known in the literature for energy transfer, but their use hasn't been that extensive in the context of organic synthesis. So it comes up a lot in things like printing, 3D printing and things like that, or polymerization reactions, but not so much in the context of medicinal chemistry or, you know, next small molecule syntheses. So we're really interested in doing this transformation. And I guess if you can forecast what you're about to see next is we were able to do this using a metal catalyst, the same type of process using this really cheap uh, molecule that allowed us to make exactly the same types of scaffolds, but not using expensive metals. Now, we certainly weren't the first ones to use these thiosanthons for anything. The, the real key player, the pioneer, really fantastic chemist, but he actually started out all the intrigue and interest with these thiosanthone catalysts and xanthone catalysts, particularly in the context of these chiral ones that he's made, and largely towards two plus two cycle addition reactions. But more and more, we're starting to see these thiosanthones um, increasingly appearing uh, in the literature. So after those original reports by Bach, a whole bunch of other applications started coming out in the context of oxygen activation, some deracimizations, and also some isomerizations by the, the, the Gilmore group. But for us, we were really the first ones to showcase that we could do the same chemistry uh, using the thiosanthons, this type of aerylation processes. So it was the first time that the aerylation processes we used for the thios, um, for these thiosanthons. So my other PhD student, Megan Oddy, who also published this last year, um, as well as Daniel Kutza, a postdoc in the group, who joined just shortly after Megan cracked this, this problem. And just to get into some reaction optimizations, what she found was when we tried to use some of these other catalysts in the presence of visible light, again, we've done at room temperature, we use a fan to just help things not get too warm, but um, they don't really get that hot usually. So we just do have a fan going for this. But what we found was when we tried to use the thio, the, the xanthone catalyst, just a reminder, this one down here. So without the sulfur, with using 10 mole percent catalyst loading um, in ethanol, trying to use a green solvent, uh, nothing happened. Uh, we replaced that with a thioxanthone, so similar to Bach's type of work. We got some, but not really anything. What was really interesting is that when we switched this to the chlorothiosanthone with 10 mol percent in ethanol, we got a really good hit, 30% or 37% uh, healed by NMR. And playing around with the conditions a little bit, we found that if we switched to trifluoroethanol instead and up the loading, we could really get this transformation really efficiently. 
And just as a comparison, as does other works, the Iridium Catalyst, it definitely works as well. But we were pleased that we could get this reaction going with a really cheap catalyst and working at the same efficiency as the Iridium Catalysts. So with that, we then just went and made a whole bunch of examples of it between Megan and Daniel. They had lots of fun in the lab. Sometimes you walk in there, it looks like a disco with all the lights shining. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. It doesn't actually because we obviously protect it. We cover it um, for our eyes, <laughs> but it would be fun. Maybe something to think about. Um, we could do, uh, you know, we could vary the aromatic group quite significantly and make a whole bunch of substrates, which is really nice to have a couple of different handles on there. So like bromine to do some Suzuki or some other types of reactions as well as dye and tri substituted um, aromatic rings and also varying the substitution patterns over here. So that was really, really great. And we also just wanted to see which other types of catalysts might work. Did we have to stick with the chloro? So we made the iodothiazanthin as well, and that turned out to work nicely, pretty much as good um, as the chloro. The one caveat to this reaction though is what we'll say is that you notice that there's optimized conditions. You use the mixture of TFE, 4 to 1, and that was really for solubility reasons. So there's, as, you, as the reaction goes on, you actually start seeing it starting to precipitate out. So we just you know, spiked it with a little bit of chloroform to help the solubility. And that sort of seems to solve the problem in, in most of, of the cases. We eventually uh, worked around this so that we don't have to use a fluorinated solvent anymore, but I'll jump to that in an, in when I speak about the next part of this work. But just for now, that's how we got around this problem. Uh, in the beginning, or just for this section. So to talk you through how this reaction works is when we take the styrosanthin catalyst, we hit it with some light, it gets excited to its singlet state. We then have an intersystem cross to, down to its triplet state. These are just all known parts. And once we access the photosensitizer's triplet state, it can transfer its energy over to the actual substrate and it gets excited. And now there's two possible pathways that you could imagine might take place. The first one is a standard, you know, photochemical 6 pi photocyclization to get to this intermediate over here. And then either you can do a direct 1,5-H abstraction down to the product, or you, you might be able to visualize this in a two-stepper. You know, you can first restore the aromaticity to get to this, and then a subsequent tautomerism to get to the molecule. But what we think is actually going on, and there's more precedent for this, and you'll see why uh, later, why we think it really is going this way, is a di-radical process where rather than forming this type of six pi head uh, photocyclic types of um, rearrangement or mechanism photochemical electrocyclization rather the double bond gets excited to the triplet state diradical which looks like that rather and then cyclizes and does the one five h abstraction rather than this type of intermediate and you'll see why um, in a second when we get to that so we've done some deuterium labeling as well just to keep track and see if this type of one five shift does actually work. And fortunately it is, this is exactly what happens. So if we label this with some deuterium in the presence of TFE, just standard, you'll notice that there's a little bit of deuterium, 45% incorporation. When we start with the D5 analog, you can actually track the deuterium hopping over to that position. So we're really uh, pleased about that. But really what we got excited about was this context of for really trying to think about sustainably, real world sustainably or practicality. So what we've done was we try to see what this might look like in the industrial type of process. Obviously, we're still working in a lab, so there's only lim there's limits to scale that we have. And of course, there are some inherent flaws of photochemistry in terms of scale. But what we what we did was we took this standard substrate and tried this on a gram scale. And just using the standard reaction conditions in the lab after seven days, it turns out we got the best conversion, 90%. This was really good because it was in line with what we had been doing on the small lab scale. So that's really fantastic. Got the same type of yields. We could do this on a gram scale. But what was really exciting was we took that catalyst because these catalysts are quite uh, non-polar. You can actually recover them off a column really easily. Uh, we took that catalyst and just chucked it back into the reaction of a different substrate, also on gram scale. So this is now the recovered catalyst from the first reaction and subjected it to exactly the same reaction conditions. And we managed to form that with the recovered catalyst. And this yield looks low, but it's actually in line with what we found on a lab scale. So that was really exciting for us to be able to recycle these catalysts. And that's essentially what you want to do when you, you know, sort of working in an environment that you don't have the luxury of, um, of um, or you really want to think about sustainability in, in, a really, in a really serious type of way. So this is really great for us. 
If you wanted to access the cousin, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the unsaturated quinolinone, uh, we were also able to take those dihydroquinolinones and just oxidize them using this uh, copper catalyzed method that's known in the literature, and we could access its, its, its little its brother or cousin, or whatever you want to call it. So really happy about that over there. So those are the quinolinones, and the other molecule that we started becoming really interested in, and of course with beta lactams, and these molecules need absolutely no introduction, obviously being really important in the context of antibiotics. And what we wanted to do, and I know it looks like it's a, it's a bit odd here putting beta lactams in the context of the serum membrane sort of azopine looking molecule, but essentially what we wanted to do was try and push this photocyclization a little bit further into making these azopines by just extending the ring slightly. So you can see in this previous example, we had this aromatic ring directly bonded to the nitrogen. So we thought, okay, if we put the spacer, one, just one carbon spacer between that, we can actually get the energy transfer diuretical forming over there as per usual. And then it just cyclizes back on forming the seven membered azopine. You'll notice here the conditions are slightly different now and we could get away with using a much greener uh, solvent. And instead, and like I said, this is exactly what the slide says here. This is unpublished work, hopefully we're gonna send it off in the next week or so. Um, serendipity at its finest. So Megan did this reaction, and instead of plopping out of this diazopine, we actually got the beta lactam. So it was really, really serendipitous, and re but really exciting. We're really happy about it. And what this is, in fact, is just an example of a, an old photocyclization known as a Norish Yang photocyclization or photochemical reaction. And historically, the way this reaction works is using UV light with some really high powered or high energy, high powered UV light lamps, you could just excite the ketone to these types of diuradicals. So similar to what we were proposing in the carbon-carbon diuradical. And then you get this 1,5-H abstraction from this oxygen to this hydrogen to form this type of triplet state intermediate. And then internal radical-radical coupling forms the cyclobutanone type of species. Right, that's just the standard Norish Yang chemistry. And this is a really long time ago. And the some applications to beta lactams also came out in 78 and 80, but these reactions used really high powered lamps. The yields weren't really great and the substrate scope wasn't really good. So we were really pleased when we saw that um, we could actually access these using our methodology. Right. But what you'll notice with our chemistry is that it's actually an example of carbon to carbon hydrogen atom transfer. And very recently, in fact, Kurt and co-workers found that they could do something really similar in the context of these naphthalene groups, getting a carbon carbon hydrogen atom transfer rather than a heteroatom H transfer to form these types of cyclobutanes, which is really interesting work. And I must say that the reaction works really nicely. This is a representative set of the types of beta lactams we can make. We can make a lot more, but we can couldn't put it all on the slide. So we could vary the aromatic group here. We can put a whole bunch of different aromatic groups. We can change it to difluoro, some functional handles on the aromatic, try substituted groups, naphthols work as well. But really interesting for us, in fact, was we weren't limited to only aromatic, you know, sort of using benzylamine type derivatives. They also worked with these types of allyl, so allyl amine or propargylamine, even some unactivated sp3 hybrid um, molecules work like diisopropyl so really really extensive scope we could vary the nitrogen group and also change the the substitution substitution pattern down here as well so really exciting stuff and i should say that while we were working on this Bach in fact published the new work that just appeared quite recently i think two or three months ago i think or, or last month it came out in press um, using a very very similar strategy making these spiral uh, beta lactam. So you can actually check out that because that's also a really, really com nice complementary piece of work that came out um, using a similar type of reaction. So as we said before, it's a similar type of reaction process where we can follow our standard energy transfer to the diuradical. We then get this carbon to carbon 1,5H abstraction to get to this intermediate species over here. And then a homo coupling to this over here gets us to our beta lactam. Sorry, this is obviously intersystem cross that has to happen first to the singlet state. And then we get the radical radical coupling to form the beta lactam. So we had thought about rather than doing this type of diuradical process, it's rather going via this closed shell Zwitterionic 
uh, intermediate C over here. And in fact, this type of adduct is what you would find from a Staudinger type cyclization reaction. So we were really wondering whether it's actually, in fact, going by the Staudinger adduct, but we think that's not happening because we ran some uh, DFT calculations. I unfortunately couldn't put them up over here, but suffice it to say that the DFT calculations support that the diuretical mechanism is certainly the one that's more appealing. And the main point from that DFT calculation is that this transformation going from the diuretical through to the product is essentially barrierless, right? Where there's a slight uphill going from the species to the Zwitter ion and then uh, down to the cyclic beta lactam. So not saying that the closed shell pathway via this doesn't work, but it's probably going via the diuretical. The other thing to note about the Staudinger with these types of Zwitter ionic intermediates is that you can actually significantly impact the diastereoselectivity of this reaction. You'll notice here that they haven't included any stereochemistry in the product. And that was very deliberate because we actually get them roughly between a 1.5 or essentially one to one mixture of diastereomers. Sometimes we got a four to one where we really load up the sterics at these two positions. But for all intents and purposes, there's almost no selectivity. On the contrary, when you do go via these Zwitteronic Staudinger type cyclic intermediates or Zwitteronic intermediates rather, you do actually find significant diastereoselectivity trends when you start playing around with the electronics, either at this type of inlet side or on what you load up on this imine side, they, you do see significant difference in the diastereoselectivity. But for us, no matter what we put on the aromatic and no matter what we put over here, we saw no change in selectivity. So that also makes us think that it's probably not going via uh, that sweat iron. Of course, we did some deuterium labeling and very nicely, we can see 100% incorporation when we use this molecule over here. All the deuterium that was at that position over there jumps over to where the inherent 1,5 process was taking place. And also a competition experiment we did also shows the kinetic isotope effect of two. So that's somewhat consistent with these types of um, one five uh, shifts. That's actually the end of my story. It was <laughs> nice and quick. I didn't think I was going to rush through the talk so much. So what I actually want to say right now is just thank you for to all my students, I guess. This is the group in its current format. And that's on the in, in Camps Bay and the nice mountains behind us and some team building exercises. So thanks to the group for doing all this work that I could allow to show you over here my collaborators in York and everyone that uh, gave me some money <laughs> to do this research. And of course, uh, Ben, thank you once again for arranging this open seminar and all of you for your attention. I'm happy to take some questions. Thanks very much. I just realized I had my microphone turned down. Let me try that again. <laughs> yeah, that, that first <laughs> great, that, that was a great talk. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting. Uh, and we'll jump into the questions. And, and if anybody has questions uh, that they want to add, uh, please feel free to do so as we go. Um, so the first one here is, uh, can you reuse the thioxanthone catalyst? Yes, absolutely, we can. So in one of the examples, um, this one over here, in fact, so what we did in this example, this grand scale, gram scale example, we took the catalyst from the same reaction on a gram scale. Okay. We recovered the catalyst from that reaction and then used it straight in this reaction down here um, to convert it to the product. We only did it uh, two, like twice. We didn't want to go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. But in principle, this reaction, yeah, definitely worked with the recovered thiazanthin catalyst. Okay. I should say that we recover this via standard chromatography. Um, we are looking into ways of sort of supporting it on beads, uh, things like that. So you could, might make it a little bit easier to recover, but we recovered using standard column chromatography at the moment. Okay. Uh, what is the reduction potential of the, the two uh, thioxanthone triplet state? So in the, so I'm not sure of the reduction potential because it is an energy transfer, but the, I can tell you what the, the energy states of these are approximately about 62, 60, somewhere between 62 and 67 um, 
kilo k, k cals per mole is that, is that sort of out. So about 250 kilojoules per mole okay. for the energy trans for the energy transfer to take place. So in these types of examples of here, you're rather looking at the, the triplet state energy. Mm -hmm. So what you really want, if you want to have an energy transfer going on, you want your triplet state energy of your photosensitizer to be higher than the energy of your substrate. So these thiosanthones are somewhere between 60 and 70 kcals per mole. Okay. So we, we know, yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Could these be? Could these reactions be done in reactors? And how do you do uh, the photochemistry on like a kilo uh, kilogram batch scale? Right. So we are have. So the the largest scale we've done was what is this one point one grams at the moment. So we don't. That's a really great question. So it's one of those inherent problems with these types of photochemistry scale becomes an issue because the larger your, your, your reactor gets, uh, the light penetration becomes an issue because these reactions are all in batch. So <clears throat> for these types of one gram scale, we just use a 20 mole reaction vial and just shine the light straight on it. But if you really want to start getting really big, we'll start looking into flow chemistry. We haven't actually seriously got to flow photochemistry, but yeah, if you want to do this on kilograms, we haven't been able to do that. Just, I think that's an. We don't just have the engineering to do that, honestly. But I'd really be interested to chatting to anybody that might have ideas on how we can scale these types of reactions up significantly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I could definitely see the flow chemistry being the way to go on that one. Yeah. But it, like you said, the the engineering that's involved is is not going to be trivial. Yeah. No. For sure. Uh, let's see. So this is okay. Do you do you always need a pi system adjacent to the amide? to perform the Norris type chemistry. And they also, this person clarified, not the olefin that participates in the closure, but the R group adjacent to the nitrogen in the amide. So the R, oh, let's go, yeah. Um, I'm guessing that, I'm guessing that this is with regards to the beta lactam. Um, uh, so, yes. Has my, sorry, has my screen, oh, there it yeah, is. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. So yeah, so you always actually, Yes, so that is one of the limitations of this particular one. Mm -hmm. You always need this aromatic group at that position. So I thought I had the slide that showed non-suitable substrates, but yeah, the, the, the limitations is you have to have an aromatic at this position, so alpha to the carbonyl. Okay. So essentially, so parent compounds of atropic acid. You can see this down here as well. If this was the double bond over there, there would always be some type of cinnamic acid or atopic acid type derivative. So we always needed the phenyl group at this position, alpha to the carbonyl. However, this one over here, it never needed to be, ben didn't always have to be benzylic, essentially. We could use allylamine. You could say that that's sort of the same type of stabilization as a benzyl group. Similarly, propargyl does work. But if we start getting really unactivated, like using uh, the diethylamine, that doesn't work, but certainly the tri the um, isopropyl amine uh, does work. So that would be when you essentially have you know the isopropyl group over here. So you have methyl, methyl, and another isopropyl at that position. That does work. So that is sort of the limit of us being unactivated sp two at this position. Okay. That that we can get away with. But yeah, absolutely. The only one we could do is having this phenyl group at this position. Okay. <clears throat> But what I will say, if you have a look at Buck's work, they actually also have, um, they, they actually do this on indoles. So they could form these sort of spirocyclic beta lactams at, when you have an indole at this position. Um, so you can also, that, that's also nice complementary work. Nice. Okay. Um, and I think the last question we might have here is uh, can any of this chemistry be done using sunlight or white light? Ha, didn't want to say anything about that. <laughs> <honestly>. <laughs> So actually, we um, last week we actually it's, it's winter now in South Africa at the mm -hmm. moment, so we don't have that much sunlight hours. But we found one really I say nice day for us. It's terrible. It's about fifteen degrees, but sunny, fifteen degrees Celsius. Of yeah. course, I'm not sure what it is in Fahrenheit. Um, it was sunny, and Megan actually popped the reaction on using these conditions out in the light, and she was really stoked because it actually does work. So you actually do have some scope to just use normal. Uh, sunlight, I guess. The only challenge you fight there, of course, is sunlight hours and cloud cover sure. a good spot. In the, but yeah, absolutely. That seems to, at least in principle, from that one reaction that we tried to be able to work with just sunlight. That's yeah. that's fantastic. Like, that's actually yeah, a really yeah. cool thing if you could, if you could really make exciting. that happen. Yeah. 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 Wonderful.
Uh, I think that's all the questions we have. So I will say thank you again, Dr. Peterson, for a fantastic talk. Uh, really interesting work that you're doing. Um, I appreciate. It. I, I got. I, I'm a, a, a photoelectrochemist background, so I, oh, I, I enjoy seeing the photochemistry work. Um, nice. <laughs> the the synthesis, Excellent. the synthesis, and all that is is far outside of my my knowledge base, <laughs> but uh, it's really cool to see all the things that that you're doing. Uh, in photochemistry. So. Uh, thank you again. Um, if I could get you to hang around for just one minute, we'll talk very briefly. Um, sure. And then for everybody else, we will take a break until about uh, 2.20. And then I'm actually going to give a talk because why not? Um, so uh, if you have, if you would like to learn about some uh, some cool electrochemistry, uh, please feel free to come back at 2.20. And um, Excellent. if not, we have our, our next talk after that will be at 5 p.m. Eastern time. So certainly... Feel free to come back for that as well. Um, until then, thanks everybody, and uh, we'll see you hopefully at 2.20.